My name is Michael Telstar, Canada's leading mentalist from Toronto, Ontario. Hi, my name is Sponza, and you're listening to my dad, Ron McConnell, on the XM. This is Psychic Dorothy from St. Catharines, and you're listening to Rob McConnell. Hello, my name is Holly Reeves, an astrologer from astro for You, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X Zone, with Rob McConnell. Welcome to The X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. <laughs> Welcome back to hour number three here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on the Starcom Radio Network. Worldwide, 800-610-7035. My email address, on air at com On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And our main website where you can listen to the Exxon 24-7-365 www.xzoneradiotv.com. And let's say you're out somewhere where you can't listen to the X Zone on the Starcom Radio Network on your local radio station, or for some reason you're in a dead zone, your your cell phone doesn't work, your iPad doesn't work, but there is something called a telephone. Remember those things from way back when? They still have telephone booths, don't they? Well. You're in luck because if you dial 213-401-0080, now once again the number is 213-401-0080, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with yours truly, Rob McConnell. And don't forget, we're here on the Starcom Radio Network Monday through Friday starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. And uh, as I always say, if you want to listen to a great show that challenges conventional radio with a legendary radio broadcaster, listen to the Ed Till Show Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. right here on the Starcom Radio Network. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is a good friend of the Exxon. Doug Elwell is the publisher of Mysterious World an online journal focusing on exotic and mysterious travel destinations around the world. Doug has twin master's degree in biblical and ancient Near Eastern studies and marketing communications from Wheaton College Graduate School and a vast amount of experience in researching and writing on religion, history, mythology, travel, and related disciplines. Now, Doug published and co-authored his first book, Mysterious World Ireland, a new kind of travel guide to Ireland through his own imprint, Mysterious World Press. His second book, Planet X, The Sign of the Son of the Man and the End of the Age, discusses Doug's theories regarding the mysterious Planet X theory and its central role in the creation of Earth as we now know it. His latest work, The Riddle of the Sphinx, explores the legend of a mysterious hall of records hidden under the Sphinx that some believe contains forbidden secrets from the world before the flood. Doug is currently completing another book about the giants, which will discuss not only their hidden history, but also their mysterious origins and destiny. For more information about Doug Elwell, his websites are, here's two separate websites, explanation, www.mysteriousworld.com. That's mysteriousworld.com and planet-x.info. That's planet-x.info. Joining me now is Doug Elwell. And Doug, welcome back to the Exxon. Great having you back on the show, my friend. Great being back on. It's been a long time. It sure has. Um, you're still busy as ever. Oh, between work and uh, working on my new book on the Giants, I'm just overwhelmed. I also do some local charity work and that sort of thing. And so all my time is pretty much accounted for. Gosh. The Giants have been put off for years, but to finally get it done this year, get it rolled out, hopefully by the end of this year. Let's talk about uh, the book that is out, The Riddle of the Sphinx. What was it that inspired you to write about this very mysterious monument? 
Well, I wrote a series of articles, actually one article on, actually four articles, come to think of it, on a real of the Sphinx back in the um, early days of Mysterious World, back in the late 90s, actually, I think it was. And because for me, the, the Sphinx has always been the ultimate symbol of mystery, mm-hmm. uh, the most ancient, the most mysterious. Some people think it's as old as the, as the flood or older, or old as mankind. Some people think, including myself, it's been actually recarved several times which explains why its head is so much smaller than its body, proportionally speaking. Some people have theorized that it possibly has been recarved so many times because it's so ancient that the head is now much smaller than the body, giving it kind of a comical appearance. But for me, the, uh, the, the Sphinx has always been the ultimate symbol of mystery, along with the Great Pyramid. Something psychological, fundamental about these images, which have always struck me as very important. So one of my major uh, themes of Mysterious World and one of the major... You know, symbols of Mysterious World is the Sphinx. Mm-hmm. And so I made it, uh, and originally made a series of articles on MysteriousWorld.com, kind of covering the riddle of the Sphinx from the perspective of, of Robert Baval and Graham Hancock's theories on uh, how the Sphinx was actually an astronomically aligned object. Uh, and the way the, the, the uh, Sphinx and the pyramids were aligned on the Giza Plateau is meant to be sort of a, along with the uh, star shafts in the pyramid, were meant to be kind of a uh, cosmic calendar which allowed people to kind of interpolate when the pyramids and sphinx were actually built. And they were able to, to turn this clock to show, for example, I think it was Draco in the north, uh, lined up with the northern star shaft in the Great Pyramid uh, back in 2500 B.C. and also in 10,500 B.C. So their theory was is that the pyramid marked its own time, the own date it was actually created as far back as 10,500 B.C. based on these alignments in the structures themselves, and of course, the period. What was interesting about the uh, the Sphinx was that if you turn a clock back to 10,500 BC, on the uh, the uh, when the sun rose heliacally, uh, you know, the sun rose on the first day of, of the spring and the equinox, um, it would actually um, come up right beneath the constellation of Leo, mm-hmm. around 10,500 BC, and they pointed out that if you if you laid the map. Uh, in the heavens upon the Giza Giza Necropolis, it would appear that the uh, sun would would be appearing underneath the Sphinx and the and the uh, the uh, belt the uh, three pyramids represented Orion's belt. So if you're aligned at the Orion's belt um, and also aligned up the, uh, the Sphinx at the constellation of Leo, the sun was seen as kind of uh, rising up underneath the Sphinx, and they deduced from that that there was this was a sort of a cosmic marker saying here's the hidden place. Or something very important associated with the sun was hidden underneath the Sphinx. And those who are wise enough to understand astronomy and, uh, and, and architecture and were able to decode the riddle could have figured that out by following these clues and eventually uh, figuring out that there is something hidden underneath the Sphinx as marked by the, the, uh, the ri- first rising of the sun at 10,500 B.C. That was their theory. I thought it was very interesting. And it, co- it kind of coincided with Casey's theories about there being, that is Edgar Casey there being a, a, a sort of a hall of records underneath the Sphinx, whereas it contained all knowledge of the world before the flood, and not only the past, but also possibly the future. And so naturally, something like that, associated with the Sphinx, all these additional things, fascinating. I mean, who, who doesn't find that interesting? Yeah. I found it fascinating. So I decided to write a series of articles on that so I could kind of understand it myself and also communicate it to others and keep it in more of a, a permanent basis. And it's been up there for, I think, uh, been at least 12 years now. My goodness. Mysterious World has actually been around since 1998, so it's been a while. Why the uh, why the configuration of animal human in the Sphinx? Do we do we have any reason to, uh, or any knowledge on why they chose that form? That's a very good question, actually. And uh, my theory is that, and this goes along with my book of the Riddle of the Sphinx. Uh, it's, it's not only about the riddle, but also about the so what is actually hidden underneath the Sphinx mm-hmm. and the implications it has, because I believe this object will be, will be rediscovered in the end times and used to conquer the world by, for lack of a better term, the Antichrist. Um, my theory is that this the Sphinx has actually, have, has actually have been recarved several times, and it's been one for every age, every major age of mankind. And my theory is it's actually a total of seven, or a total of six times, or a total of seven heads over time. And this is what's described in the book of Revelation as the beast with seven heads. Ah. Not a dragon that actually has seven heads at once, but a, a beast that has seven heads over time. 
representing the ages of mankind. And so my theory is, in fact, that the, the Sphinx used to be uh, painted red, and the, and the dragon in the book of Revelation is also described as being red. It's also, it's actually sitting in a pit. It's actually dug out of a pit-like structure. It looks like it's crawling out of a pit. Uh, the beast is in the book of Revelation is said to be rising up out of the pit. And also, um, there's something hidden underneath the Sphinx, which I suspect um, might be a very powerful, not only a very powerful tool, uh, a means of, uh, you know, a storage device for huge amounts of data, all knowledge, if you will, but it also could be as a, very, as a very powerful weapon. And this weapon could also be used by the Antichrist to conquer the world, which is his destiny. And this, this thing has literally been around since the beginning of human history. Um, it was known as the, the Tree of Knowledge, the Mark of Cain, the Tsohar that uh, uh, Noah hung up in the ark to give it light. Huh. Um, Abraham also had it. This, it was, and it also, I believe, was found by Moses, possibly by Elijah. Jesus may have been tempted by it in the wilderness. And it will return again in the end times, uh, used by the Antichrist to conquer the world. And what it is, is my theory, is it's this basically this huge sapphire stone, uh, a lens-shaped, transparent, into which was written all knowledge using a laser. And though that sounds kind of woo-woo, it actually is possible, because we can use lasers to write data to the insides of a, of a crystal, mm -hmm. like a sapphire. That's, that's, uh, that technology exists now. In fact, it's been around for decades. So my theory was, when I originally was studying the Ark of the Covenant, uh, I was just studying the Ark Stones, and the Ark Stones are described by the rabbis as being made of sapphire. And it also says in the, in the, uh, in the Old Testament that uh, the books were written on one side all the way through the middle and to the other side, not on all, just on the outside, but actually inside the stones. And so uh, since they're made of sapphire and crystal can be used to store data, uh, my theory was that God gave uh, Moses these optical, these, these sapphire stones, which were effectively optical, what we would call optical hard drives, mm -hmm. in which was written this massive amount of data. And that data was, and this is described not only in the Ten Commandments on the stones, but other parts of the Old Testament say, all the writings and, and you know, the wisdom and all this other stuff was written inside of them, too. So this was stored inside of the Ark of the Covenant, which was essentially a, a supercomputer with, uh, with two optical drives inside of it. Um, and with those who had authorized access, like Moses and the priests, could actually use this, this device, the ark, to speak with God and see him face to face like it was a television set. That's what, that's what it literally says. One of my theories is that one of these sapphire stones was stuck in between the cherubim's wings on top of the ark. It was sort of like a TV screen. And they, when it says in Exodus, Moses went into the tent of meeting and saw God face to face over the ark of the covenant um, between the cherubim. I think it literally was like a television viewing screen where you could literally see God face to face and talk to him, and God could see him and talk to him. This is technology, is computer like technology, which is kind of a very interesting uh, study, particularly since it could exist right now. And, and the technology, we may be in the process of reinventing it or possibly rediscover it. If it does, if a stone of this type actually is buried underneath the Sphinx, a different stone, different to the ones of the Ark of the Covenant, but the same technology. This one is a much larger, much more, more powerful version of the stones found in the Ark of the Covenant, which contains all knowledge, not just parts of it, but all knowledge. And this stone was so dangerous that it had to be carefully hidden. And the Sphinx is a place that's been hidden over time, only occasionally brought out for special uses. And I, I talk about that in my, my book, The Riddle of the Sphinx. My theory is that the Israelites, uh, when uh, Joseph was given the rulership over Egypt underneath the Pharaoh, actually dug out this stone from underneath the Sphinx and used it to talk to God. And that's actually described in the prophecy of uh, Gad, one of the sons of Jacob. And I talk about that in the book. How when you reinterpret his prophecy, it literally can be translated that Gad um, dug underneath the right paw of the Sphinx, found a tunnel, and pulled out something which was called the lawgiver, which is like a stone of some kind. And he used this lawgiver stone to to judge Israel appropriately. My theory was that he was talking about something like what was used with the Ark of the Covenant, a kind of a covenant stone, which could be used to communicate with God. They used the same thing back in the time of Joseph, a different stone with the same technology. And this stone reappears in history occasionally at major points in, his, in human history, and it kind of decides the fate, of, the fate of nations. And I do believe it will reappear in the end times in the hands of um, 
sinister forces, which will use it to conquer the world. And this is what the Bible refers to as the, the, the beast and the Antichrist. Exo Nation, Doug Elwell is my special guest. Uh, we're talking about his new book entitled The Riddle of the Sphinx. Two websites, www.mysteriousworld.com and www.planet-x.info or planet-x.info. You're listening to the Exxon Radio Show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, right here live and around the world on the Starcom Radio Network. Okay, so, Doug, are, are you saying that the Sphinx was where the Garden of Eden was? The um, Actually, I don't know. It's possible that the Garden of Eden was uh, what is now the Nile Delta. Mm-hmm. My theory is that Eden stretched from the Nile Delta on the west all the way to uh, Mount, what is what was called in the Bible Mount Sinai in the east, particularly the mountain called Serebit al Kadim, which was called the Gates of the East. And that was the eastern gate, which is described in the Bible. It wasn't just a small garden area, but it was a vast, huge garden, fertile garden area, which is, Egypt still is. And there were more rivers, and it was probably the whole area was like the Nile Delta as opposed to just the Nile. And so, actually, when the Israelites went back to Egypt as part of the, you know, the, their sojourn, mm-hmm. they were actually returning to, to the Garden of Eden, or what is now um, located on top of the Garden of Eden, uh, Egypt, and areas east of that, which comprised the old area of, Egypt, of uh, the Garden of Eden. And, um, yeah, so my theory is that they actually uh, were there, and also hmm. Mount Sinai was kind of a return to Eden. In fact, they, Mount Sinai itself was the mountain of the first time which they were originally thrown down from when Adam and Eve sinned. Um, so one of the, uh, for example, the, in the, in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the Garden of Eden is actually described as being underground. And it's made up of these uh, trees made of stone. And on the, on the stone trees, there were these jewels, which had knowledge inside of them. And, uh, Adam, you know, when, when, you, when you, these jewels were able to, give, to make you wise and so forth. And, like, they were hanging from the trees like apples, kind of, you know. So my theory is, is that Moses kind of enciphered this knowledge in a way that was, you know, not, not pagan. Uh, borrowing the same knowledge, using the same knowledge as described in the mm-hmm. of Gilgamesh, but his, his, his approach was that these, these stone trees with jewels on them, as described in the Epic of Gilgamesh, was actually a tree of knowledge with an apple on it, or fruit of some kind. And when he ate the apple of knowledge, it made them wise. What it actually was, in a modern term, is these were like uh, st- optical hard drives, like I was just talking about. Right. It's crystal stones which had data written inside of them and could be accessed maybe by voice control or some kind of keyboard like we have now or something. And then you could use that to gain knowledge, like to learn, to be educated. And they gained access, and so the Garden of Eden was basically not just a garden, as we understand, like a, a fruits, but a garden of knowledge where there was all kinds of different, these of these jewels, which would contain different types of knowledge, which were useful for various things. But there was one large central jewel on the Tree of Knowledge uh, that they were specifically forbidden to, to access because it contained dangerous knowledge. And this knowledge, uh, which is the knowledge of good and evil, which is a Hebrew metaphor for all knowledge, both good and bad. Um, they, they access it in an unauthorized way. It could be a Satan, the, the serpent, gave them the password to get into the computer and use it to show them things they weren't supposed to know. And uh, so my theory is that these were actually computers, what we would call computers, very much more sophisticated than what we have now. Um, they put computers so sophisticated they could almost literally, if not actually literally, literally, read your mind. So, so Doug, when we, when we look at the big picture, if we say that the, the Sphinx has a lot larger role within our past than many give it credit, and does this mean that everything we know or everything we believe when it comes to the Bible actually started in Egypt and not anywhere else? I'd say that was partly true. Okay. I think Egypt actually uh, was, was a parallel tradition for a long time. A lot of these ancient uh, Egyptian gods like Amun, Ptah, uh, um, you know, Ray actually is a big one. Mm-hmm. Uh, they all had similarities to the Hebrew god, but they're also very different. What I think they did was they take the various aspects of this original Hebrew deity, which actually original deity, which the Hebrews maintained as a monotheistic position, and they took more of a henotheistic position where they said, okay, there's an aspect of God 
there's like a great red eye. There's an aspect of God like he's like a ram. There's an aspect of God, uh, you know, he was, he'll be raised from the dead like Osiris. And these became um, these concepts which were kind of literally, were literally concretized in the form of idols or mistakenly worshipped as actual gods, where actually they're supposed to be didactic tools, mm -hmm. teaching. This is a concept you need. This is the concept of, you know, resurrection. This is a concept of, you know, far seeing. This is a concept of, um, you know, whatever. And these things, these are concepts were just supposed to be ideas, ideas of a small eye, but they turned them into ideas with a big eye, saying, "Idea" as in "I am a god." You know, the Latin word "dia." Yes. I they made a capital I god and started worshiping them, but they were just small I ideas. And and when we see with the Exodus, we're seeing God saying these aren't mm -hmm. capital I ideas. These are small. These are small I ideas. They're just concepts. They're not beings. They don't. They don't have to be worshipped. I gave you this knowledge is to help you live a life, not to enslave you to a silly religion that with a god that doesn't exist. And so I think one of the reasons that uh, uh, he called himself I am who I am is that he says that literally means. I am the only thing that really exists. I am the real God. These are fake. And in the process of Exodus, he dethroned them in, in the eyes of the Egyptians, saying these false gods which are enslaving you to their false religions, they're, you know, get away from this stuff. It's garbage. And so this was kind of the first kind of reversion to scientific and uh, almost secularistic thinking where um, the, the, the universe is not the manifestation of deity as the pagans saw, but just a dead, you know, you know, it's dead matter, which is born right. in various states. And uh, the only deity there is is one. And so it's kind of, it's it's much more similar to the situation now than it was back then. It was, it's, it's interesting to think of it in those terms. Doug, in, in your opinion, and based on the research that you've done over the years, who built the pyramids? You know, I'm not sure. It, it seems likely that it was done by the actual Egyptians, but something about it mm -hmm. leads me to believe it was actually done by people much earlier than that. Because uh, the, 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 the uh, regular archaeologists make a good argument saying, you know, there's a period of building at the start of the Saqqara pyramids, which were just these layer cake kind of situations. Right. But they get more, much more sophisticated in the, in the penultimate pyramid, which is the Great Pyramid of Giza. But the Great Pyramid of Giza has a lot of internal components which make no sense if you're just creating a burial chamber. I mean, people have measured the interior and noted that um, it would be impractical to make this a burial place because you cannot, for example, the sarcophagus in there had to be built into the pyramid. As it was being built, you couldn't have brought it in there. And, and the, uh, the, the space for the opening of the king's chamber is t relatively tiny. You have to get down and crawl in there, hmm. which makes no sense. It, it serves no purpose. It was for a funerary. It makes, it's, you, should, you would never do that. You'd make it nice and big so you can walk right in there with all your torches and the music and you know, all the, the pomp and circumstance. Moreover, when uh, the Arabs first broke into the Great Pyramid for the first time in thousands of years, I think six, seven hundred years ago, something like that, they found that there were uh, these these slats in the floors uh, pointing up, which made it very difficult to walk. And, and when they walked on them, they broke. Um, but when people have reproduced the interior of the Great Pyramid, they, they noted that the slats were designed in just such a way as to perfectly reflect sound back towards the king's chamber. And the king's chamber itself was resonated m musically, tuned to be musical, and the entrance of the chamber allowed only just a certain kind of frequency in uh, the height of it. It was very well tuned for music. In fact, uh, specifically for what was called an F sharp chord. It was you know when people say Amen, yes, church, that's yeah. sharp, an F sharp chord. And so there's this kind of this universal Amen thing, you know, the Egyptian Amun God, and so yes. forth. Yeah. Um, that uh, is kind of fundamental to the universe, and the, and the Great Pyramid kind of encapsulates this. And I wrote this mm -hmm. in, my, in one of my um, uh, articles, a series of articles on the Great Pyramid. Actually, it was, ah, it was Syria. It was the third article back, I think it was 2002 or three. And uh, basically, the entire pyramid is designed to kind of resonate with a sort of F sharp chord. Even the subterranean chamber seems to have been specifically tuned to do the lower notes of this F sharp chord. And acoustically speaking, the the uh, Great Pyramid is crazy, gigantic, basically this gigantic resonant chamber designed specifically to create an F sharp chord and aim it towards the King's Chamber. And the King's Chamber itself is made up of granite, which contains I think it's 50% quartz crystal, red granite from Aswan or something. It's really it's imported from a long way away. 
and only the only the king's chamber, I think maybe the king queen's chamber, are made of this material. Everything else is just regular limestone. And so the theory was, by wackos like me, is that this place was actually designed to be kind of a, a, an echo chamber, because in the F sharp chord caused this crystal to kind of resonate and give off electricity in a piezoelectric way, which would be, which would happen if they were vibrated more, you know, violently enough, it would create an electrical field. Right. And inside of that, um, the king, the uh, the chamber, the uh, sarcophagus, so called, is the exact same size as the Ark of the Covenant. Hmm. So some theories theorize that an Ark, an Ark of the Covenant-like device once sat inside of the king's chamber and was used uh, to help kind of... The king, the the, uh, the great pyramid was actually built around that Ark. It was specifically designed to amplify its power. And at the top of the peak of that pyramid was another stone, possibly a Sohar stone I was talking about earlier, that very large um, sapphire stone, which then uh, kind of great, you know, took this... Uh, amplified arc energy and massively amplified it more and used it to basically broadcast energy uh, for either communications, uh, healing, or even destruction because um, it could, I suspect, have projected a very powerful laser. I mean, powerful enough to take out not just ships or armies but entire civilizations. Really, really powerful. Uh, and this is this is probably what the secret of the um, the uh, Pharos Lighthouse was. The Pharos Lighthouse had a mysterious energy source that is top that beam of light. It was able to reach the horizon and burn ships maybe 100 miles away. Regular light could not do that. In fact, regular light would not be bright enough, you know, from a fire, would not be bright enough to see, be seen for more than a That's couple right. of miles yeah. away. They were able to see the horizon line, which is a long way away. And so uh, my theory is that the same Sohar stone or one like it was also uh, used in the Pharaoh's Lighthouse, which was in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, I, I remember. I remember. On top. I am sorry. I remember years ago having Chris Dunn on the show, and he believed that the Great Pyramid actually held, or was built to hold a power source. Mm-hmm. I was partly inspired by um, his theory, the Giza power plant. Yeah. And I took I took a variation on it. He actually got much more elaborate. Um, I think he was his was the idea to have it uh, the harmonically tuned inside. I I believed his yes. arguments. Yeah. But I also um, yeah a lot of this stuff isn't my original ideas. I want to make that clear. Uh, it's stuff I've studied over the years. Sure. So Chris Dunn should take credit for that for sure. Um, but I added an additional uh, dimension. And his theory was that the sarcophagus sarcophagus excuse me sarcophagus itself. Yeah kind of tuned uh, the energy coming in from the northern and southern star shafts, which basically it was once, apparently his theory was it was once lined with gold, and some gold could still be found in there. Um, and this gold um, transmitted in rays from the sun and also from the stars, which was focused into the sarcophagus and retransmitted to a satellite in space where it could be, you know, rebroadcast for other uses. I thought that was a little far-fetched, but it was an interesting idea. And also when you do the measurements, the sarcophagus... Uh, is not in line with the star shaft, so it doesn't really work. It's too short. But uh, the star shafts uh, would bring in light uh, just above the sarcophagus and reflect it on an object that was inside the sarcophagus. So my theory was that the light from the northern and southern shafts, actually, if that did come in, actually shone on the um, crystal in between the cherubim on the uh, Ark of the Covenant device that was in there, uh, sort of an antediluvian arc, the one that existed before the time of Moses and the time before the flood. Uh, Moses was really basically reproducing ancient technology for use in his time. Tell me about the connection. Tell me about the connection between the Sphinx and the Giants. The Sphinx, uh, the Sphinx, actually, uh, connection has to do with the Sohar stone, which is hidden there. And my theory is that the Giants were created by uh, the fallen angels to try to recover this stone, which had been lost in ancient times. And uh, in my book on the Giants, uh, the Sohar stone, what I call the Sohar stone which in uh, certain ancient manuscripts, I think Freemasonic um, legends, describe as the Stone of Exile, the Lapis Exilus, mm-hmm. the Stone of Exile. And, the, uh, and they, have this, they have their own alternative version of the battle between Michael the Archangel and Satan, or Lucifer, in their writings. It's kind of a Sith legend, like in Star Wars. And they talk about how uh, when Michael and, uh, and Satan fought with each other over the supremacy of heaven, 
that Michael defeated um, Lucifer by striking the great stone from his crown, the Lapis Exilis, and it fell down into the universe to Earth, where he's been searching for it ever since. And my theory is that this is the very same Sohar stone, also known as the Tree of Knowledge and so forth, which Satan has been searching for this entire time to try to recapture it, because it's kind of like Sauron in the Ring, in the Lord of the Rings. Once he gets the thing back, he'll become extremely powerful again. He'll be very difficult to defeat. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Tolkien's idea of Sauron in the Ring wasn't largely inspired by this concept of uh, Lucifer trying to regain his crown, in particular the stone of his crown. Uh, known in the Bible as it's so hard stuff. Um, and so my theory is I took that I take that in the book and I follow this as, I take this as kind of the MacGuffin. This is the kind of the driving force, the object that everyone's trying to get throughout the entire book. And the giants I believe are specifically designed to help Lucifer recapture this stone. And God created the Hebrews specifically to make sure that, that stone was not captured, one of the main reasons. And so it was the stone was actually handed down from Hebrew patriarch to Hebrew patriarch, all the way after it was taken away from Enoch, or not Enoch, but it was given to uh, to Cain initially by God as a means of ruling the earth because it's, it can be worn as a crown. And the uh, mark of Cain was actually not a, like a mark on his forehead; it was actually a crown that he wore um, on his head. But why? The but why crown. would God? Why would God give Cain this this crown? If he had killed his brother Abel, uh, because uh, people were hunting after him, he said. Cain said to God, I, "You know, I, you know, I'll be hunted down and destroyed." Sure. Uh, he's a hunted man, and so God had to give him something to protect him. Now it says it doesn't say that specifically in the Bible. It just says so that there's, there's a mark on his forehead. Mm-hmm. There's a mark on his head, actually. Let's say forehead, and there's a kind of concept that somehow protects him. But and, you know, you and I know both know that nobody cares about a mark on the forehead. They're going to shoot him with an arrow, or they're going to hit him with an axe. Well, yeah, and plus I, I never understood why God didn't punish him for killing, because this was the first murder that, uh, you know, that's been recorded. And yet God well, gives him this mark to protect him. And then he crosses sure, the desert, he crosses the mountains where he lays with his wife, and where the hell did she come from? <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know, that is one of the mysteries for sure. But. Yeah. Um, he needed, well, Cain had a destiny, as did his descendants. He, God created him for a purpose, to, to procreate and create people who were, de- who were destined to live, so he couldn't execute him because he, needed, he had plans for his descendants. So he exiled him, he had some mercy on him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, in the end, things will work out. He'll, he'll, he'll reward the, the just and punish the unjust in the end. So it's his plan. I mean, I'm not going to question him. Do you think these um, giants are going to return? Yes, I do think they return, they return periodically um, to Earth as part of uh, an, uh, part of invasion forces by, uh, for lack of a better term, aliens. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, they resurrect these giants as part of breeding programs and use them to conquer the wor- world and control it in their stead. Uh, in the ancient times, the giants were believed to be have been created by fallen angels as a means for them to kind of rule the Earth by proxy. Mm-hmm. Because fallen angels can't do it because they're not physical beings, so they inhabit these modified humans, which are specifically designed to be vessels for them to inhabit, and then they rule the earth through them. And these royal lines still exist to this day, blue bloods, as they're called, different kinds of people who are genetically different than us in some ways. Um, they consider themselves to be superior, um, partly because of their, their bloodlines are different than ours, they believe. Hmm. And so the theory is that they actually were, at one time, blood world bloodlines, which were not truly human as we understand it. They were enhanced. And these were the giants and their descendants. And until the Romans and other peoples ended up wiping out the giants. In fact, Caesar's conquest of Gaul talks at length about how the Gaulish giants were six, seven, eight, nine feet tall, and they had a heck of a time defeating them. Um, when, they, when they conquered the Gaul, when the Romans conquered the Gauls, and also fought against the Germani giants, which were the most terrible of all, the German giants. They ended up having to use phalanxes and uh, spears and and arrows against them because individual one-on-one combat they'd get slaughtered. So the only way they were able to defeat them was to use walls of spears and arrows and and um, and, um, and javelins and spears to kill them. And it's, it's interesting to read the stories about how fearsome they were and how fearsome yeah. they were. Um, 
You you and I have talked uh, at length about Planet X, Doug. In fact, you've written a wonderful book about it. So how does Planet X figure into this entire scenario that we painted for the listeners tonight? Well, Planet X, um, it kind of defines a major, also defines major uh, eras in history. My theory is it returns every 2,000 years or so to herald a major change in human history, specifically around the Hebrews. Now, uh, and also, right before the planet X returns, the giants appears, uh, they appear to um, re- be repopulating. And planet X appears about the same time that they're at their peak and destroys them. So it appears, that what my theory is, is that uh, when the fallen angels were cast down from heaven, they mm-hmm. created the giants in order to help them try to retake heaven. And so the giants um, are routinely rebred uh, every, every few thousand years. They were rebred during the time of Abraham, and it's referred to as the iniquity of the Amorites, which came to the full around the time of Moses, which is about 600 years later. And so uh, the appearance of, of Planet X appears to coincide with rebreeding times of the giants. And my theory is that it's possible that they, um, if they didn't actually live on this planet, they're somehow associated with it. And whenever it comes around, it, they are thrown out. They make, an, they make an attempt to retake this planet but they're cast back down to Earth, and this happens on a regular basis. And so possibly when Planet X is about to return, you can be assured that the Giants will also be returning because uh, they will be trying to build up their forces again in order to oppose the reappearance of this planet and those who may live on it. So how do we prepare for Planet X, and, and what do you think will happen when it next arrives on our doorstep? Planet X, uh, right in the past, it only has appeared as close as the asteroid belt. It appears as a very bright star, uh, which moves. It's a planet which looks like a bright star. It actually mm-hmm. looks like a huge comet. And uh, the last time it appeared, I believe, it appeared as the star of Bethlehem. 2,000 years before that, it heralded the birth of Abraham. Abraham's birth was said in the Jewish legends to have been heralded by a, a bright star as well during the time of, Nim- of, of Nimrod. And it'll, I believe it will appear again um, in the end times as a sign of the Son of Man and the end of the age to herald the second coming of Christ, as described in Matthew 24 and 30. And uh, what we need to do to prepare for that is to understand that, as, as it describes in the book of Revelation, uh, in the middle of tribulation, um, I think it's the sixth, or the sixth seal, it's people, the, it, the men, mankind looks up into the heavens and sees God's throne. And they say, hide underneath all the rocks. They say to the mountains, hide us underneath the rocks from this throne which is coming. Uh, from the wrath of the Lamb. So I, well, my theory is that they actually first begin to see Planet X, which is just then becoming visible for earthly telescopes, and they're realizing that the jig is up and they're about to be attacked by a gigantic, massive planet coming right at them. And their theory is that they can hide from it in caves and underground. So the best thing you can probably do is to, to dig in deep and hope for the best, because if, and also have storable food and water, lots of it backed up. Seven years worth probably be a good idea. Seven years. If you do that wow. ahead of time, you, you should be able at least three and a half years. Uh, the first three and a half years appear to be difficult times, but you could probably survive just barely. The last three and a half years, if you're not prepared for it, you will probably die. So I would say at least three and a half years of food and water stored away deep underground in a non earthquake area with solid walls, not made of dirt but of stone. And uh, be prepared to stay under there for several years sever from, from humanity and expect the worst. So do you have any bad news for us? <laughs> well, we don't know when this is going to actually happen, but if it does come back around, yeah, and um, you'll be able to see this because of the signs of the times, it's clearly written in the Bible what will happen in the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Jesus has a very succinct description of the end times in Matthew 24, where he goes through the entire process in order, you know, you know, wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, mm-hmm. earthquakes, false Christs, um, you know, massive destruction from uh, the rise of the Antichrist against, uh, you know, persecuting Christians and so forth. And well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this question because you you just you know you said uh, the Antichrist will persecute Christians. Yes. So are we looking at something that's happening in today's world? As we have the uh, the problems now with Islam and 
their persecution of Christians? Could this be a sign of the end times? And could the um, could Muhammad be interpreted as the Antichrist? It's possible. Some have um, interpreted the uh, the word Ismailah mm-hmm. as uh, kind of looks kind of like the letters number six six six. Um, and, and people think that it, I think in Germanic it also adds up to six six six. I haven't I haven't thought that um, theory particularly, but I've heard of that, and it's interesting that um, Allah could be a, a different than what we thought it was. I don't want to say on the air what I think it might be, but mm-hmm. some have speculated that. Um, but what actually what's going on with that is unclear. I tend to think the Antichrist will not be Muslim, but it might be part of the equation. And Daniel talks had had make some cryptic statements in in the book of Daniel where he says. Um, uh, the Antichrist will kind of build on its base, build on a place an idol on a base, and the word uh, the word as um, the word Al Qaeda actually literally translates as base. So I was wondering if Al Qaeda weren't somehow uh, a means of building up this end times empire as mm-hmm. an excuse to fight against the terrorists who are you know or fake terrorists made up to have an excuse to have a deterrent against the terrorists, you know problem, reaction, solution. So I think the Bible might be intimating, and some have already exactly the set earliest. They might be fake. All things might be a fake to, in order to give the Antichrist and his forces an excuse to conquer the world in the name of freedom and democracy and the fight against terror. Is, is it possible and, that the end of the world as described in the Bible has come and gone? Um, well, no, because we're still here. So. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Is it possible that the interpretations of the book of Revelations and how the end of the world is supposed to play out didn't happen as the script called for it to happen. I, I don't know. It's, it's the things that described in the book of Revelation mm-hmm. really haven't happened that I'm aware of, so I could only speculate. Now, some people believe that the uh, events during the time of Ro- the Roman Empire may fit the actual description of the book. Of Revelation, the beast was like Nero and stuff right. like that. But it's some of the other things, like the descriptions of you know the third of the green grass being burned top of third of the trees and all the rest. It, none of that ever happened. So I've always found that to be um, you know kind of suspect because right. it really didn't seem to fit the, the pattern very well. So, do you have any new books coming out, uh, Doug? Are you working on any new projects that we can look forward to in the future? I uh, worked on a book in the Giants, like I described yeah. earlier. Yeah. It's much more in detail. It's not just a list of giants, and you know, giants of North America, giants of Euro, giants of Asia, like I had with my series on Mysterious World. This is actually more of an in-depth look into certain tribes of giants and the origins of the giants, and things of that nature, where um, you uh, you know, just kind of understand not only their why they're here, mm-hmm. you know, what they were, why they're here and what their purpose is. So I'm digging more deeply into speculating as to why why did the giants exist, and why were they created, what's the purpose, and their ultimate destiny. Uh, the theory is they're created by, like I said, the fallen angels to not only rule over mankind as proxies, but mm-hmm. also search for this ancient technology, specifically the Sohar Stone, and recover it. And in fact, I suspect a lot of the archaeological expeditions during the 19th and 20th centuries were actually sponsored by secret societies specifically designed to um, find this ancient technology and um, you know you recover it and bring it back yeah. to the points to people who are trying to find it so they can use that ancient technology, gain advantage over others, and, and conquer them. I think that's one of the things that will be found at the end times underneath the Sphinx as the most important part of this technology. Uh, so hard stuff. I understand. I un- yeah, I understand the person responsible for Egyptian antiquities will not let anyone go near the Sphinx to investigate this. He's been keeping people away for a long time. And, uh, it's understandable that you want to protect the monument, but then again, um, no one can go there, which is a little, little extreme. Mm-hmm. So uh, one wonders. If no one can go near the Sphinx, no one can dig even near the Sphinx or even go find the tunnels underneath the Sphinx. Why, you know, why are they doing that? No one's doing any research. People are asking questions. We're not getting answers. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it's, it's kind of suspect. Why aren't they doing the investigations? Why aren't they checking to see? Is there a chamber right this sphinx? Uh, why, why can't we see it? Yeah, so they, that, that raises more questions than answers. So you wouldn't need to dig. All they'd have to do is use ground radar. You know, and yeah, they could confirm it with ground radar. Sure. We have much more sophisticated radar now. We yeah. can confirm it. It just uh, it, it tells me that they don't want to find it because it's being hidden on purpose for a certain time for a certain person to find it, and that that person will be the Antichrist or his forces, which will use that as a means of giving them advantage over others. A P, it'll be the, I suspect it'll be installed, kind of a supercomputer, which will be installed at the peak of a, of a network of computers known as the Internet. Mm-hmm. And so my theory is that the Internet is actually being built as sort of this electronic pyramid, uh, like on the back of the dollar bill. No, it's not a pyramid of stone, but a pyramid of, of electrons and, and networks and, and web servers. And at the top of this will go a master stone, a master computer, which will rule them all, uh, sort of a one ring to rule them all kind of concept. And once that's found, they'll install that thing. And the supercomputer will be vastly superior to anything mm-hmm. we have on Earth currently. And we'll be able to hack into all these computers and control them, and through them control everyone. And oh, the like, like the Chinese are doing. Yeah, everyone's trying to do it. Yeah. But the one with the best computer, the fastest computer, will win. And the Sohar Stone um, is the fastest computer because it was created by God himself, or possibly by Satan. And he is being the most brilliant person and the most knowledgeable about how the universe works. His computer will be the fastest, and not even the best human computers could beat it. So he will win. He will defeat them, take them over, and through them rule all the computers on Earth, and through the computers rule all the people. And the mark will be basically a computer chip or something like that, which will be the end of the chain. Through that, all the people on Earth will be ruled by this central master uh, stone. So our stone may have sapphire sapphire supercomputer, for lack of a better term. But if we know this is going to happen, isn't there a way that we can prevent it from happening? There's different, there's different, um, you know, schools of thought. Mm-hmm. Now. People think we can, we can fight the future and fight against prophecy and alter the future. Others think that prophecy is prophecy because it has to happen. You can, prophecy cannot be altered because... It's already been seen. Well, isn't a prophecy just a just just a, a prediction? And predictions can be changed at any given time because we are given free will. Therefore, if in the prophecy the seer sees us turning right, and if we turn left, there goes that prophecy. The way I think of that is like in the Matrix. Mm-hmm. Um, you're probably familiar. With the Matrix, sure. Yeah. Is that the only way they're able to control the people inside of the Matrix? It was discovered that they had to create a program which gave them the illusion of free will. And that was known as the Oracle. And one, as long as they thought that the Oracle was giving them free will, even if they weren't completely sold into it, the possibility of free will was enough to keep them under control. My theory is that we are living in a situation where we have the illusion of free will. But in actuality, we're all going towards the same predetermined goal, which is inescapable. That prophecy, by definition, is something that must happen. Prediction is something that might happen. They're different. Prophecy is about things that will happen. But isn't the strength of the prophecy based on the strength of the believer? And not everybody reads the Bible. Not everybody believes that the prophecies in the Bible are real. Not everybody believes that the Bible is written in verbatim. A lot of people believe that it's based on the world as perceived by those who wrote it at that given time in history. So there's a lot of variables at play here. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. I can only speculate, mm-hmm. but uh, my understanding of prophecy versus prediction is prophecy is something that will happen, prediction is yeah. something that might happen. What would happen if the events in the Bible that happened so many thousands of years ago happened today, this very moment in time, with the knowledge we have of science, of physics, chemistry, biology, and, and everything else at our disposal? Would these events hold the same significance in the society that it happens in today as it did thousands of years ago and kept alive throughout the book? I think that, well, if, if they uh, had significance, mm-hmm. if they happen now, it would be perceived differently, maybe, but not a lot differently. Uh, the same miraculous events would be seen as miracles. Uh, the same people would be saying the same things. 
doing the same things. It might be perceived a little differently because our culture is different than it used to be, but mm-hmm. the events themselves, I don't think it would be that different now. Uh, so, yeah, I don't. Uh, it might be that uh, the events in the Bible, in the book of Re- Revelation, yeah. or in certain prophecies, may actually be happening now. We just didn't interpret them properly. Right. The giants that you talk about in your new book, um, would the giant in David and Goliath be one of these giants? Yes, uh, Goliath was a descendant of, of the Rephaim, those who came after the flood. It says in the Bible, Moses says, um, the giants were on the earth mm-hmm. in that time and also afterwards. And the giants of the world before the flood were refer, referred to as the Nephilim, but the giants in the world after the flood were referred to as the Rephaim. Uh, Nephilim means those who came down, mm-hmm. but the Rephaim means those who were reborn or healed or restored. So the giants literally means, the Rephaim literally means the giants that have returned. And so you have the giants returning every once in a while and to reappearing on the earth and causing problems again, all really to the point where um, God found it necessary to wipe them out. Not This time now with a flood, but with... Um, uh, uh, this time, next time, we, uh, during the time of Moses, he actually raised up this nation of holy warriors, the Israelites, to wipe them out because he didn't want another flood on, on the earth. And he wanted to um, keep the earth as it was. And the giant um, mm-hmm. repopulation was kept in check um, just in time for it really being right. spread. And I suspect there was also a disease associated with them called uh, Zarat in the Bible, uh, which spread along with them, which also not kept in check may have required another flood-like event to if, wipe if, out as well. If God created everyone on earth, and he is the, the, the father of everyone, or the source of everyone, and if the Egyptians were that much further ahead in technology and wisdom, why would he select the Israelites who, as far as I know, really had no technical advantage uh, advances compared to the to the uh, the Egyptians. Why would he pick the Israelites to be his chosen people and not his? Why would he pick the dumb son instead of the smart son? Well, they weren't dumb. They were just simple, and they had been enslaved, so they weren't allowed to be advanced. Um, I think the reason was is that. Um, God doesn't work well with proud people because proud people tend to go their own way. Or is it that he doesn't like the challenge? Or he doesn't like uh, anybody trying to be as equal or better than him? Possibly. Yeah. We've seen in history people who try to be like God and tend to cause a lot of damage. Yeah. The giants were an example of that. People in during the 20th century who, mm-hmm. who abandoned God like the Nazis and the, and the Soviets. They killed millions of people in their quest to have the perfect state and they failed and left a gigantic disaster behind them. And we see what happens when men try to be like God. They fail catastrophically and cause massive damage. The, the Egyptians were poised to do the same. So, um, And the Egyptians, as I described before, kind of got the core concepts, but they were expressing them incorrectly, and they were worshipping the concepts instead of understanding them as just concepts. And so they were confused. And gotcha. they, their, their behavior was strange, and they were backwards. They were like a cargo cult where they understood the form but not the function. And you understand what a cargo cult is, I'm sure. It's for your audience, I'll explain what that is. Uh, when missionaries are dropping off um, cargo and off food and, and supplies to you know, primitive peoples in South America during the early part of uh, the 20th century, um, the natives would see these airplanes flying over and mm-hmm. receive the gifts. And in their primitive minds, their minds not being uh, primitive, but they were uneducated. They were thinking in terms of you know, idolatry and right. magical thinking still. Still caught in that mode, as were our ancestors. Hey, hey Doug, I hate to do this, but our time is nearly up for tonight. I want to thank you so much for coming back on to the X-Zone. Looking forward to having you back on again in the future. Um, thank you. It, congratulations on your books. I look forward to getting a copy of your giant book. And take care of yourself and keep the great work up. All right, thanks. You too. All right, Doug. Take care of yourself, my friend. Exonation. Doug Elwa has been my guest this hour. www.mysteriousworld.com and www.planet-x.info or planet-x.info. Well, that's it for this week. I'll be back Monday night at 8 o'clock as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exon. So from everyone here at the... 
studios and corporate offices of Relmar McConnell Media Company and my staff and the Exxon Nation. To each and every one of you out there listening to us on the Starcom Radio Network, have a wonderful weekend, have a safe weekend, and always remember to keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone.